Hello everyone, how is it going? Welcome to The Mudroom, our weekly free Uncommon Sense Parenting class. How are you today? If you're Canadian, I hope you enjoyed your 2-4. If you're not, I hope you're enjoying the end of your May. <laughs> it's almost summer, y'all. I can feel it. June is always a very busy month for our family. We've got three family birthdays, including my youngest who is turning five. I don't know about you, but five always feels like when they become a big kid to me. I think because like pre-kids, I was used to hanging out with preschoolers <laughs> all the time. But it's hard to believe my baby is going to be five. Oh my goodness, where does the time go? And it is my 10th wedding anniversary this June, which is also kind of hard to process. It's, <laughs> it's hard to believe that my husband and I have been together for 15 years, let alone that we've been married for 10 of them. All of that to say, because June is super busy for me personally, we generally do reruns in June. So I'll be choosing some oldies but goodies to replay for you on Facebook, and we'll be reposting them to the podcast as well. These are always good opportunities for those of you who've recently discovered The Mudroom to go back and check out some old but still very relevant episodes. And then I'll see you again in July. All right, so I've been getting lots of questions lately about sensory seeking, which I'm both elated about and find kind of funny. <laughs> it's amazing how much awareness has been brought to sensory behavior over the last several years. When I first started Uncommon Sense Parenting five years ago, the notion of sensory stress was almost completely unheard of. Like most parents had no idea what it was. And now I get questions about sensory issues almost daily. That said, lots of parents don't actually know what sensory issues actually means, how to recognize it or what to do about it. So I wanted to talk today about what sensory input is, why we need it, why some kids need more of it than others, and others avoid it more than others, and what to do if you suspect your child is having a sensory challenge. Before we jump into our topic today though, allow me to introduce myself to those of you who don't know me. My name is Alana Robinson. I'm a parenting coach for parents of toddlers, preschoolers, and kindergartners. I help you understand why your children are misbehaving and how to fix it without yelling, shaming, or timeouts. I'm your host here on The Mudroom. I'm also the host of the Parenting Posse Facebook group, and I'm the creator of the Parentability Program, where I help you raise well-behaved kids of your own. No matter where you're catching this class, please like and subscribe so that you never miss another one. It also helps us reach more parents who need support. I encourage you to comment and ask questions as we go along. This class is pre-recorded, but I'm here. I'm available to answer your questions in the comments, and you can always follow up in the Parenting Posse as well. So let's start off with what does sensory even mean? <laughs> Sensory refers to our senses. Most know the main five, sight, sound, taste, touch, and smell. But there's also two more. There's mechanoreception, which encompasses the internal sensors that tell us where our body is in space and in what position. So vestibular and proprioceptive input. And interoception, which is an awareness of how your body feels internally. So for a typical person, all of these senses somewhat self-balance. We take in the information we need and we learn to filter out the information that isn't significant or that we don't need. And typically, we don't have to think about that. <laughs> Our nervous system automatically dulls too much information and automatically amplifies information it requires. But it can cause problems when we get too much or too little. Our nervous system requires breaks to recover. Generally, we can deal with periods of high sensory input without much issue, as long as it's not constant. But if it becomes constant and we never get a break to rebalance, our brain stops being able to filter out the unnecessary input, and generally that's when we start to feel overwhelmed. This is what's happening when you're touched out. This is what's happening when your kids just won't shut up and you feel like you're going to explode. This is what happens when something stinks and you feel like you're going to puke or when you spin too fast and feel like you're going to puke. <laughs> the same is true of the opposite. If we don't get enough, we feel very unsettled. We can feel really depressed. We go out and do things that are dangerous or risky to try and get that input. 
In an adult context, that often looks like risky sexual behavior, physical risk taking like jumping out of planes, doing things like going to an excessively loud concert to the point that it damages your hearing. So you go to more loud concerts, etc. Our brain uses the sensory input we receive from our senses to make sure that we're safe and to help us make decisions. We need this input, but too much or too little of it is a big problem, especially for children because these senses develop and get stronger the more we use them. But everybody needs different levels of these inputs. No two brains are the same. No two bodies are the same. So some people are much more sensitive to different kinds of input and others are much less sensitive to it. The thrill seekers who do stuff like bungee jump off bridges and enjoy really extreme roller coasters, they tend to be people who need a lot of mechanoreceptive input. <laughs> people who we typically label as introverted tend to be overly sensitive to sound, touch, mechanoreceptive input, and interoceptive input. People who we tend to label as extroverted tend to be underreceptive to those things. And the important bit here is that when you aren't getting the level of input that is optimal for your brain and body, you have to expend energy to try and regulate that, to either seek it out or avoid it. And energy expenditure is stress, right? It all comes back to stress. And we know that if our child is expending lots of energy regulating their sensory needs, whether that's on filtering or seeking, that means that there's less energy available to do all of that top level brain stuff like learning, language, and using their executive functioning skills, which means we see a rapid decline in behavior. So what should we do if you suspect that your child's behavioral struggles are due to sensory stress? Well, the first thing that you want to do is test your theory. <laughs> if you think they're seeking, give them some more of what they're typically jonesing for more of. Does that result in some calm afterwards? Chances are, if they're sensory seeking, that it will. If they're upset and triggered or they avoid certain activities, try avoiding those for a few days and seeing if that behavior subsides. If it does, chances are they're having some difficulty filtering. Now note, these are not long-term strategies, <laughs> okay? I'm not suggesting that you just give them more or avoid things for them for the rest of time. This is like a maybe one week scenario to test out your theory. And then we need to come up with a long-term strategy of how we're going to help our kids manage that and ultimately teach them how to self-manage that stress. And that's where it's up to you to decide where you're going to seek your support from. Generally, when we're talking about extreme sensory needs, we're talking about getting in with an occupational therapist. And that's fantastic. That's definitely someone that you want to have on your team and someone you want to have on your team that is local because OTs really need to see and interact with your child in person to assess them properly. But a lot of my clients find that there's some limitations there. OT sessions are expensive. They're rarely covered by insurance or only partially covered. And many find that the sessions are limited to the specific sensory issue their child is experiencing. And now they're kind of stuck because they don't know how to generalize that information into their everyday life, into daycare, into school. And that's where parent's ability comes in because sensory stress is just one kind of stress. It's a biological stress. But there are four other kinds of stress. There's social, pro-social, emotional, and cognitive as well. And we may still need to address those. And then once we address their stress, we have to go a step further to building those skills so that we see that increase in capacity. They're able to do more with less. And in parentability, we give you the ability to take that information, all of the different information that you have about your child and put it all together so that it's actually usable. It's doable. So many parents are the experts on their kids but they don't know what to do with all of that expert information. In parentability, we teach you how to put it together so that your day-to-day -day life becomes so much easier. I find a lot of parents are overcomplicating it and they're making it this huge thing that they have to focus hours on daily and it really doesn't have to be that way. The first step to joining parentability and figuring out if it's the right fit for your family is to actually take my free class, How to Raise Well-Behaved Kids Without Yelling, Shaming, or Timeouts. 
In it, we talk more about stress, we go deeper into skills and why they're so important, and we go into critical thinking, which is what I think most parents think their child's main problem is, but is actually the last step in the whole process. <laughs> and we just updated the class too. So if you'd like to grab your seat, you can find the link for that in the description. All right, that's it for today. I hope that that helped clarify for you what sensory information is and why it's important for your child to experience it and why it might be causing some of the issues that you're seeing. If you have questions, as I said, drop them in the comments or come and let's chat about it in the Parenting Posse. We have so many amazing parents who've been there, done that, and can help you figure out what the right direction is for your family, all right? I'll see you again next week for a throwback on Common Sense Parenting class. Bye.